Good morning, everybody. Um, we'll make a start, uh, I think. Um, welcome to today's conference, which uh, I know is the culmination of a lot of very hard work in Fermanagh and Oma District Council Sales Academy programme. So today is the culmination of um, a great deal of effort, and we hope that you find it uh, a very useful experience. We have several key speakers with us today to share their experiences, which uh, we hope will inspire your business to strive for even greater things in the months and years ahead. And uh, there will be an opportunity for you to engage directly with some of those participants in our series of masterclasses um, taking place later this morning and then in our panel discussion just before lunchtime. Um, we'll start off by hearing from our keynote speaker very shortly, Niraj Kapoor, who will be talking about the seven steps to successful selling. As far as the masterclasses after Niraj are concerned, um, just a quick bit of housekeeping on that. If you're attending Neve's masterclass, um, it's taking place in this room. If you're taking part in Gareth's session, you should head into the room next door, just down at the back. And if you're taking part in Andrew's masterclass, you'll need to go upstairs for that. But council and full circle staff will bring participants to the upstairs talk if you just make your way um, out into the corridor where we had the reception. I think Stephanie um, in particular will be there to take you upstairs. So if you don't mind making your way to those masterclasses as quickly as possible, um, we can get them started on time because we've got a lot to fit in between now and, uh, and one o'clock. And I think the organisers are also very keen for participants to take the opportunity to network during the breaks because they're a great opportunity to get speaking to other business owners in person rather than, than on screen. Uh, I've talked to a few people this morning and there's a bit of a novelty factor, I think, in actually being at a conference like this again after two years of, of no conferences, no meeting face-to-face, -face, and Zoom is a wonderful thing, but um, there comes a point where uh, this is what you actually want to be doing. So it's lovely to see so many people <laughs> in one room at the same time uh, today. After the break, um, we will have a panel discussion with three successful local entrepreneurs, and during that, then there'll be an opportunity uh, for you to ask questions from the floor as well. So hopefully we'll build plenty of time into that. Um, if you're posting on social media about the conference today, uh, you can use the hashtag FODC Sales Conference. Hashtag FODC Sales Conference. So before we dive into the main business of the day, let's hear a formal welcome from the Chair of Fermanagh and Oma District. Um, someone I'm sure you all know very well, someone I used to enjoy spending time with, um, in a previous life, on the other side of COVID, uh, on the hill, will you welcome, please, um, newly installed in his job, Councillor Barry McElduff. It's always a privilege to team up with Mark, isn't it? Um, Mark was at Queen's University around my time. Um, I would have been a first year when he was a fourth year. I'm only joking, Mark. <laughs> I said that one time about Eamon McElhome, the singer, you know, in respect of Oma CBS, I said Eamon was a seventh year when I was a first year. It's the other way around, you know. But uh, thanks very much, Mark, and it is great to have you in Oma. I genuinely mean that. And uh, as chair of the council, I'm delighted to be able to extend this welcome. Falcheroi Villig. And uh, our speakers before we even hear them, are definitely top-rate, high-caliber, and inspirational. I said that to Andrew, not to put pressure on him. And I was talking to Neve there at the table, and uh, I would know Neve uh, in a local neighborly sense, and uh, she was starting to use language to me, her neighbor. You could say her, her own neighbor talked about spin-out and diagnostics and software and pilots. And I said, is this the way you talk nowadays, Steve? <laughs> I remember you in Pomeroy, in the Rowan Centre, when you didn't talk like that. <laughs> but we look forward to hearing you. And obviously the theme of today's conference is doing things differently, innovating for business growth. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, you will have had the opportunity to network with like-minded business owners and uh, managers. Um, Everybody has had to radically alter how you, you operate or you operate it. And uh, everybody knows the context. I don't need to go into detail about that. And uh, by the way, my speech will last about another two minutes. You'll be glad to know. <laughs> I don't indulge. But uh, resilience, I think business has had to show tremendous resilience. And uh, resilience is a, is a key uh, characteristic that you need in business. 
and innovation is the watchword. Um, I hope today's event gives you the knowledge and the confidence to embrace change and do things differently to enable you to see these changes as opportunities rather than challenges. Now, our council, our local government authority, Fermanagh and Oma District Council, is very committed to ensuring that our economy is thriving, expanding and outward looking. And today's event is very much part of that. Um, the economic development section of the council is probably one that I'm really interested in. I was saying um, to one of the colleagues there uh, that Kim McLaughlin's directorate and also um, John Boyle's directorate, they're all about people and they're all about uh, the economy and, and about the social agenda. So they're the two directorates that I'm really interested in within the council. And we are developing place shaping plans for both the towns of Oma and Enniskillen to capitalise on the strengths and opportunities that exist in both towns. And we want to hear people's views, of course. Um, I'll commend Full Circle, and I was speaking to Ruth at the commencement of proceedings, who are delivering the Sales Academy programme in partnership with Oma Enterprise Company. And I'll just take this opportunity to praise Oma Enterprise Company as well. Uh, they do fantastic work, uh, tremendous success story, uh, Oma Enterprise Company and the centre. And uh, any time I go there, I come away very reassured that we have such an agency in this area that serves the people well and nearly always late 90s anyway or 100% occupancy rate and very good programmes been delivered all of the time. It goes with the territory of being chair of a council that you have multi-engagements in one day so I'm glad this has been recorded. I will watch it back on YouTube because I want to be inspired as well. Uh, we all need inspiration and uh, Mark there accused me, and I would ask him to withdraw the remark. <laughs> he accused me, he says, are you just here for the photograph? So Mark, I would ask you to withdraw that remark. <laughs> Definitely not. But uh, just one other wee thing, you know, um, I was talking about Neve and, uh, you know, some of the language of business. A good friend of mine, Des, I said to him one day, what do you do, Des? And he explained to me, it took about five minutes, and he explained to me what he did me and another fella, and he said, uh, that's what I do. And I said to him at the end of the five minutes, I said, uh, I don't know what you do. <laughs> I said, I really don't know what you do. And uh, he said, I'm glad you pointed that out. I may have a communications deficit. <laughs> but me and another fella didn't know what he did after five minutes, you know. So sometimes people have to simplify their messages too, you know, and uh, for that relevance and, and all of that. But as George Mitchell said, I would love to stay, but I have to go. And uh, I'm going to leave it at that and thank the Silver Birches for accommodating this great event. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Uh, Chair, thank you very much indeed. I'm pretty sure I remember you being a couple of years older than me, but never mind, at Queen's. Maybe I've misremembered. Um, and a novelty there to hear a politician who, don't know if anybody else noticed it, didn't use the P-word protocol once in his uh, contribution. So whether it will come up or not as a relevant subject um, throughout the rest of the day, we will see. But, um, but that was interesting. And, and thank you very much for your warm welcome, Barry. And we wish you well. Um, let's hear then from, from today's keynote speaker, Niraj Kapoor. And Niraj is back living in Northern Ireland after 25 years in London working in sales and running sales teams. He's delivered LinkedIn training uh, and one-to-one -one coaching to over 350 small businesses plus corporates including the likes of Barclays, NatWest, Sainsbury's and Google. Um, Niraj, um, you're very welcome and we're very keen to hear what you have to say to us. Thank you. Thank you. Show of hands, please. How many people in this room work in sales? Just so I can get a rough idea. Okay, thank you. And another show of hands. How many people in this room are normal? Just normal, everyday people who just have normal jobs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just to let you know, everybody in this room works in sales. I had a wee look at the delegate list a few days ago. So McGarry Wedding Designs, you sell happy experiences. Locktech, you sell security services. Digital Performance Lab, you sell growth in a digital world. Oma Sports Massage, 
you sell relaxation services. You see, everybody works in sales. But yet the word sales makes so many of us so uncomfortable. And why is that? Well, there's two reasons why. First of all, we've had a bad experience of somebody selling to us. Or the second reason is we've tried to sell to somebody else. It's been an awful experience. We think, oof, never again. Now, here's the thing. As business owners, if we have a setback and we give up, our business is finished. That's it. There's no more business left. Yet in sales, so many of us go up so quickly. I've been lucky enough to spend 25 years of my life working in London and five of those years traveling around the world running shipping events and shipping teams. And whether I've worked in Seoul in South Korea, which is very different to Shanghai, which is very different to Dubai, which is very different to New York, which is completely different to LA, which is very different to London, which is very different to Port Stewart, which is very different to Belfast. Every business owner I speak to, every entrepreneur I speak to has similar challenges. They're not quite sure how to use LinkedIn, but they know they have to use it. They want to get more people to open up their emails. They want to get more lead generation. They don't quite understand sales process, but they know what's important. And they can't think of anything worse in the world than having to network. These are the biggest challenges people have consistently year after year. And by the time I finish speaking today, I promise you, you're going to have seven steps to successful selling that will cover all of that. Now, the first part of selling. I only have one request today, actually. Please take notes. Actually, two requests. Please take notes and please take action. If you take notes, instead of just learning, where you're only going to take home 20%, you take notes, you're going to take home 40%. And if you take action, which we're all going to do at the very end today, you're going to take home 70%. And I'm going to give Ruth some bonus documents as well to email to everybody afterwards that will help you with further learning in sales as well. Okay, so that was my promise to you today. Ah, okay. How many people here have watched TV show The Apprentice, please? Just a show of hands. Wow, most of the room. Okay, brilliant. So Karen Brady is one of the most formidable businesswomen in the UK. Star of The Apprentice. Uh, age 23, she was a director of Birmingham City Football Club, and now she's vice chair of West Ham. And four years ago, she gave a talk at the University of Buckingham. And even though I worked in London, I lived in Milton Keynes, and, and Buckingham's nearest university, and I've been giving talks about sales, and I got a chance to, to hear her talk in front of a, a, a select audience. And she was exactly as you would expect, intelligent, formidable, and just quite brilliant. And at the end of the talk, in front of all these business owners and entrepreneurs, she asked, do you have any questions? And there was complete silence in the room. And I reluctantly raised my hand and I went, Karen, I wanted more time with my family and I wanted less stress in my life. So I set a business up. And unfortunately, the whole room burst out laughing. That wasn't the intention, but everybody burst out laughing because if you want less stress in your life and you want family time, you do not set a business up. And I said to her, I'm really nervous actually. I'm quite scared because I've had this great career in the corporate world. And I thought running a business would be quite easy. I've got all these skills and yet, it's the most difficult thing in the world. I'm really struggling here, and I can't seem to generate any revenue for my business. What advice do you have for me, please? And Karen gave me her advice. She was very eloquent and very funny and very helpful. But what happened afterwards was incredible. She approached me afterwards in front of all my peers, people I didn't even know that evening, who become future customers. And uh, she said to me, you do sales training. We need a sales trainer at West Ham Football Club. Do you have a business card? This is Karen Brady. My business is struggling. I'm one of the most successful and brilliant business people in the UK is asking for my details. And I gave her my business card. And she goes, on Monday, I will contact you. I'm like, this is incredible. My career's taking off. I had a few months of struggle, and it's going to take off. That's four years ago. And just so you know, Karen Brady still hasn't called me today. She still hasn't. <laughs> um, I've spoken to her assistant, Natalie Hughes, so many, for several months I spoke to Natalie, her assistant, nothing at all. But the point of this is, is two points. A lot of people in the room approached me that day and spoke to me. I said, that was a great question you asked. I wanted to ask that question. So when you ask questions here today, not just with myself, but the other speakers, there's a good chance other people are feeling that same way too. And you get recognized and noticed. And one of the most important things in sales is to stand out. It's not to fit in. And the second thing is, questions are an absolutely vital part of sales. 
There's no, the, the days, it hasn't happened too much in Northern Ireland, thankfully. It happens more in America, definitely. And it happens a lot in London of the slick salesperson who knows the answer to everything. You don't have to know the answer to everything. But asking great questions says a lot about you as a person. And when you ask great questions, you understand your customer, you get information from them, it does show intelligence, it helps you provide solutions, and at networking events, which we'll be doing later on today, it helps you understand people better. So the first step to selling is asking great questions. Now, what is a great question? Well, there's a number of examples you can use. When I meet people, I like to say to them, you know, the world has changed so much in the last even a few months. What changes do you see happening to your industry in the next three to six months? It's a good question to ask because you're asking somebody's opinion and you're talking about the future. Another thing I like to do when I meet people is I always research their company or their LinkedIn profile and I'll talk to them and I'll comment on something I read on their website, which most people don't do, but they should do. And I'll say, I read that blog on your website, or I read that case study, that's amazing. How do you feel about that? And again, I ask their opinion, I ask questions. And when I finish asking questions, I recap that back to them. And the reason I recap it back to them is because the second most important part of sales is listening. Now, um, we're gonna have an interactive exercise for two minutes here, and I really hope you enjoy it. Everybody else has done this in the past. So, can everybody please get into pairs? One of you has to be an A, one of you has to be a B. You can do this at your own tables. If anybody doesn't have a pair, I'll pair up with you. It's not a problem at all. So please, in the next few seconds, everybody get into pairs. One of you is going to be an A, and one of you is going to be a B. Okay? So decide among yourselves very quickly who that's going to be, please. I'll be your partner. I'll be your, I'll be your partner. Do you want to be an A or B? Okay, that's funny. I'll be B. Okay, hands up all the A's just so I know who they are. Fantastic. Okay, here's the plan. A's, I want you to think about the most important thing that's ever happened to you in your life. It can be the birth of your children, or in my case, the day your kids left home. Um, it can be when you bought your first house, bought your first car, been the dream holiday, became an aunt, an uncle. It's entirely up to you because it's your story. It has to be real, of course, but it's your story. And Bs, I want you to imagine what A's are saying to you. You're just not interested, okay? So you can look at your phone, you can put your hand to their face, you can look, look above their forehead when they're speaking, avoid eye contact, you can go to the bathroom, get a drink, I don't mind. For the next 30 seconds, I want you to ignore everything they say, and I promise you there's a reason behind this. Okay, 30 seconds, three, two, one, go. What's your name, Gary? Uh, yeah, Gary will do the thing, whatever you want. It's how we start thinking. It's a really bad thing. Uh-huh. I'm sure people are stupid. It's a very surprise. Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. I think what you said is absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not normally a dick. I'm just <laughs> I'm with the yeah. Okay, stop everybody please. Thank you. All right, uh, hands up the A's please for a second. Okay. How did you feel being ignored and not listened to? I lost my train of thought. You lost your train of thought? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's really frustrating when people don't listen to you. Who else was an A, please? Okay. What was it like? Yeah, it was just awful because I, I just stopped talking because she was an A. <laughs> <laughs> been really rude. <laughs> That's fine. Well, I promise you the reason behind this. So, we're going to do the same exercise again, except this time, B's. 
I want you to imagine everything A is telling you is the most fascinating thing you've ever heard. I want you to imagine like you really genuinely care and you're listening to every single word they're saying. Okay, 30 seconds. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> so, whenever I open my class, it's not the fact of travel and three years working in the class in this game. But like, it's oh, well to be like, you know, the biggest thing is that one. And whenever I came back, I had a lot of money for the game. And then it was just the start of the sequence of the growth. That's amazing, congratulations. And uh, I won the one service in the gym and the large performance facility. Well done. And it's, it's just been a, a very significant part of developing the identity of who I am. It's given me the whole family and it's been the classic of coming up where I have become and what I've been able to do. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Do you follow Ben, uh, ben Francis at Tim Shark? Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Incredible story. And it's, it's an outlier to an extent, but it's, it's still inspirational what it's been able to do since young age as well. That's amazing. I love to learn more during the break, but that's that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. Okay. Everybody, thank you so much. Okay, hands up bees, please. Who were the bees? Okay, how did you feel? When, when you were actually being... Sorry, A's. How did you feel when bees were actually listening to what you were saying? Did you feel better? Did you feel worse? What was it like? A lot more confidence. I could continue the conversation and give more detail and have the Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. I was really horrible to you. I just looked at my phone the first time around. How did you feel this time when I listened and to what you were saying? <laughs> Thank you. I was listening to what you were saying. I was supporting you as well. As well, I, I can give some recommendations. So we checked out, you know, Ben Francis at Jim Shark, who's one of the greatest innovators in this country and a great outlier. And I give advice to you. I was able to talk to you and listen. And that's what listening is about. Thank you so much, by the way. Um, you make people feel valued when you listen to them. You help build trust quicker with people when you listen to them. And that's why listening is so important. Most people don't listen. They listen to respond. They listen so they can sell their products or services. And it's very important. Listening, you know, a lot of people think sales is about closing a deal. It's not. In fact, closing a deal is only 10% of selling. And asking great questions and listening is like 20, 20, 20. It's a huge part of it. So please listen as much as you can. Okay, and it's interesting. The reasons you listen are the same reasons you ask questions, <laughs> okay? It's to understand the customer, it's to get information, it does show intelligence on your part, you provide solutions, you build trust. Now, this is your customer, or an example of your customer, in the sense that all day long, they are inundated with emails, with meetings, with meetings about meetings, with WhatsApp, with social media, with LinkedIn, with everything. Plus, if you've got members of staff in your company, you're dealing with staff issues as well. And you've got to deal with your personal life. You want to make life as easy and as simple as possible. And questioning and listening is a great way of dealing with that. Now, before lockdown, one in five people were having mental health challenges. By the way, I've called this mental health, but it could be mindset too, because a lot of them cross over. And during lockdown, it became two in five people had mental health challenges. And now it's three in five. It's now actually crossed the 50% barrier, which is pretty scary. And there are a number of things you can do or that you should be doing if you haven't done already that will help you overcome this. Now, these mental health challenges can come from overwhelm, from exhaustion, from our complete addiction to technology, which most of us unfortunately have. I love technology, but it is addictive from the struggles of the world to the prices of everything in the world, there's a lot of things to be scared about. 
And having good mental health, having a good mindset matters. So what can you do to deal with that? How many people in this room have got a vision board, just out of curiosity? One, two, three, four, five. Hmm. 10 to 15 percent. That's interesting. Okay. A vision board is absolutely key. And what a vision board is, it consists of two things. One is materialistic, because we're human beings, and the other is the personal side of things. So the materialistic is all the things you want to have in life. Your car, a, a dream holiday, more money, a bigger house, a second home, whatever it is that matters to you. Because again, it's not about you wanting what somebody else wants or what your parents want or your mates want. It's what you want. And the second part of it is the personal element. It's your family, your friends, your loved ones. And what's interesting about vision boards, women are amazing at doing vision boards. They're very thoughtful, they're very intelligent, they're very good. Men are the complete opposite. We do terrible vision boards. We have like 50 million pound yachts and we have sports cars and we always have at least one Kardashian. I mean, literally, it's... it's <laughs> but the idea of a vision board is it keeps you focused. It stops you getting distracted. As business owners, you're all going to deal with rejection at some stage. In my case, almost every day, I used to have to deal with rejection all the time. The first few years of business were just the worst. Now I love business. I can't think of anything better in the world. But at the beginning, it was pretty tough. And having a vision board keeps you centered. It helps you when you're not in the mood to do anything. It helps you on a Friday afternoon when all you can think about is, I can't wait for the weekend. It helps you most of all when a client says, you know what, I can't pay the bill. Or even worse, I'm not going to pay the bill. Or when you've pitched for a business and you're convinced you've won it and you lose it to somebody else because they're cheaper. This happens to us all every single day in business. And what a vision board does is it helps keep you centered, it keeps you grounded, it keeps you focused. Now, before we leave today, we're going to have five action points which all of us are going to take going forward. It is entirely up to you what those action points are. I would strongly urge all of you, one of your action points should be a vision board. Like I said, it should be. I can't force you to do anything. It's going to be entirely up to you. But if you haven't got a vision board, please write one. In fact, what I'm going to do afterwards, um, I'm going to share some documents afterwards with Ruth on email writing. And I'll, if you remember, I'll send one on a vision board as well on how to create a vision board because otherwise it'll take up the entire session. But vision boards are very important. There's been a lot of research recently as well on morning routines. A lot of research, but what morning routine does, you get your morning right, you're set up for the entire day. And the most important thing, and I can't stress this enough, and I stress this to every business owner I work with, never, ever, ever check your phone first thing in the morning. Never check news, never check emails. The morning has to belong to you as much as possible. If you have kids, I appreciate it. It's more challenging, but the morning has to belong to you. That means no news, no email for at least two hours. Doing that is like getting off a drug, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> it's like trying to quit sugar. It is one of the most difficult things you will ever do. But it's like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it becomes. First thing in the morning, get your body moving. I was up at 5 o'clock this morning. I, I, I live in, uh, near Antrim, but I had to travel from Coleraine today. So up at 5 o'clock this morning, I went for a half an hour walk to clear my head, and it took me just over two hours getting here today. I then went for a second walk for 10 minutes, then had breakfast, prepared this speech. You've got to get your body moving in the morning. It really helps with energy. And there's one thing we need as business owners. It's more energy. And keeping your phone on silent two to three times a day. An average person looks at their phone every six minutes. An average person under 30 looks at their phone every 65 seconds which I find shocking. Well, actually, I don't find shocking. I've got three stepdaughters. That's all they ever do. But it, it's, it's kind of terrifying. And it holds you back. And every time you look at your phone, you don't just suddenly snap and get back into work. You're distracted. So keeping your phone on silent or vibrate three times a day for 90 minutes, you will get amazing work done. And this is all the latest research. Everything I'm explaining today, by the way, is based on personal experience as well. Everything is based on personal experience. But things like morning routines, I back up with research. So make sure you plan your day on paper. I know a lot of young people here today might go, what do you mean paper? No, paper is fantastic. It, it's, you think differently. When you're spending all day staring at a mobile phone, it's really important to take breaks for a start for your mental health. But also it's really important to write things down. This is what all successful people do. 
Uh, spent every day eating smart, says a large man on stage. Um, <laughs> spent every day reading, learning, either from a podcast or a book. And if possible, when lunchtime happens, again, I, I go into offices all the time. As soon as lunchtime hits, the first thing people do is they look at their phone. Then they look at their phone while they're walking to a cafe and reading their packed lunch, and they look at their phone when they go outside. Just take a break for 10 or 15 minutes from technology. It is one of the best things you will ever do. It helps regenerate your brain. And that's a morning routine. Now what's interesting is very few people talk about evening routines. Evening routines are just as important, yet they're never discussed. So in the evening, I strongly urge nobody to drink coffee unless you're going out for a night, because it will keep you awake. Chamomile tea is a blessing. No technology, 30 minutes. No technology in bed. No dirty laughs, please. No technology in bed, nothing at all. No phones in bed, no laptops. Personally, I know people who use gratitude journals. It really helps them sleep at night. A gratitude journal can be any A4 diary where you write down five things you're grateful for every day. And by the way, when you have a really bad day, gratitude journals are even more important. Evening routine. Uh, no news. Yeah, I don't watch the news. So um, phone and airplane mode. I don't take caffeine after 4 o'clock, but just be careful with caffeine. It'll keep you awake at night. Self-care is something not many people talk about. And women especially have tremendous guilt about this. Please don't. Please take care of yourself. I understand if you've got other responsibilities in life, there's a great habit of putting your family first, and I get that. But make sure you're taking care of yourself. Make sure once a week you're doing something that makes you happy as well. You can't just live for other people in life. You've got to take care of you. Because if you do it, you can take care of others better and you can do better in business as well. So please take time to treat yourself. These are just more like reminders of things we often forget about. Now, talking about your problems too. Um, until two years ago, nobody knew who I was. I was just an everyday person struggling with a business. And I had about 1,000 followers on LinkedIn. Today, I have 24,000. Now, on a business platform, that is unbelievable growth. And part of that growth came by default because I moved back to Northern Ireland, having lived in England, or lived in, and worked in London my whole life, lived in England and Buckinghamshire. I went through the worst divorce. It was horrible. And then two months later, I thought, okay, I'm going to get back on my feet now. I've gone through the trauma. I'm going to be okay. Lockdown happened. My clients disappeared. And I was stuck four months in lockdown with no one to talk to. It was horrible. And I was, I was kind of struggling a bit in life, not knowing what to do, which is embarrassing because I'm a coach. You know, As a coach, you should be able to help people. But I, I couldn't help anybody. And so I started writing about my problems. And writing about your problems is one of the best things you can do. And by the way, you don't have to publish this. You can just write it for yourself and get it out of your system. I chose to write it on LinkedIn. And all of a sudden, I got 2,000 followers and 3,000. All of a sudden, I had this massive following I wasn't expecting. I'll come more to that in the LinkedIn section and the importance of personal stories. But writing about your problems and talking to people about your problems is a really important thing to do when you're struggling with mental health. Don't keep it to yourself. It doesn't help anybody. And the last thing is surround yourself with great people. Get rid of negative people in your life. Uh, this was a tour I did last year. I literally went around the UK. I met all my customers. Uh, I got into a car, stayed at Airbnbs, and just spent it meeting customers, old friends I hadn't seen in years, and, and LinkedIn connections. That was brilliant. And this is how you keep depression away. It's how you keep mental health problems away. It's not just one thing. It's a combination of vision boards, morning routines, evening routines, surrounding yourself with good people, and venting your problems. So, we're halfway through this morning. One thing, this image is here is I talked about sales. And sales is about standing out. Same as LinkedIn, same as business. It's not about being the best of the best, although by all means aim for that. It's about standing out. About a year and a bit ago, as things were starting to take off for me, I looked at what my competition were doing. And I just did the complete opposite. I became that red arrow flying in the opposite direction, saying, yep, you guys go this way, I'm going to go this way. So my competition weren't being consistent on LinkedIn, so I was consistent. My competition weren't doing video. I embraced video. My competition were sharing boring motivational quotes. I did original content. My competition didn't talk about their personal life. I talked about all the charity work I do and how I give back to society. And I just did everything different to my competition. 
So your second takeaway today really should be what makes me different to other people or how can I stand out? The answer can't be customer service, by the way, because everybody says that. But your second takeaway needs to be what is it that makes me different? And also, are people aware of it? Because there's no point being different if it's not in your website or your communications. But it's such an important part of sales. How do I stand out from other people? Okay. Number four, email writing. Email is the most common form of communication around the world. It's not the most effective, but it's the most common. Can everybody see this, by the way? Okay. Let's make this interactive. Have a look at this for a second. Then we're going to talk about how to improve it. Because uh, I'm sure you, much like me, get hundreds of emails sent every week that are really and truly are atrocious. And rather than just criticizing them, I want to look, how do we make this better? Because there's a really certain rhythm and system to email writing, which is actually quite simple, which most people don't understand. So I'll give you a second to look at this, and we'll talk about how to make this better. Okay, what's the first mistake? Show of hands, what's the first mistake? We can improve. Go ahead. Thank you. About 30% of the emails I get every day say hey or hi. Uh, the most important book you will ever read as a business owner is called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I would strongly urge you all to buy it or to download it. I'm, I'm sure it's an audible. Um, there's an entire chapter dedicated towards this. The sweetest sound is a person's name. Always use a person's name in an email and always use a person's name at a networking event. So today when you meet people, repeat their name back to them. They love the sound of their name. Okay, what else can be changed in this email? Show of hands, please. Go ahead. Yep, that's, fair. that's a very good point. Um, he also said it's been a while since we last spoke. I've never spoken to the person, I did check. <laughs> but yes, starting off in the negative isn't brilliant. Uh, one of the best ways to start a conversation with anybody what most people do is they talk about themselves. Most people, when they send an email, they immediately talk about themselves and they say, I can help you do this, but if you don't know me, you can't help me with anything. If you haven't asked me any questions, you can't help me with anything. So I always recommend sharing some insight that will help somebody in their job. This is really important. Not enough people do it. So um, let me think for a second. Let me give you some examples. I read some examples out at the beginning. I read some examples at the beginning of people who are here. So, LockTech, you sell security services. If I was LockTech and I was trying to sell my security services, I would say, um, you know, 50% of business owners in Oma are susceptible to a, a, a cybersecurity attack. Here are three things you can do that will make your life easier. So immediately you're giving some advice to people. Oma Sports Massage, relaxation services. Okay. So my ex ran a beauty salon, so I understand the importance of massages, sports massage, and facials. And as a business owner, you're working all the time. Even when you go to bed at night, you're switching off. You're not switching off. At Oma Sports Massage, we help you in your business. We help you relax. We help make your life better. These are the kind of things you do when you open a conversation with people. Digital Performance Lab, you sell growth in a digital world. The world is going digital, yet most people have moved with the times. Here are five things you didn't know about going digital today. You're helping people, you're giving advice straight away. That's the first thing you should do. Don't talk about the awards you've won, don't talk about what you do, don't talk about your business, don't talk about how long you've been around. Share advice immediately. Um, does everybody see the corners of this email? Exactly. 60% of email is read on a mobile. Um, I read majority of my emails on the mobile when I'm at airports, <laughs> when I'm traveling a lot. And if it starts going off the edges, it's a pain to read. Just be aware that most emails are read on mobile. You want to keep it succinct. You want to keep emails short. You want to keep emails to the point. Most people don't do this. If you have any questions or a demo, please contact me. Never finish an email like that because, it's, again, it's very generic. Everybody does this. If you have any questions, contact me. What you want to do is you want to have a PS. And research shows, even up until a few months ago, PSs at the end of emails are magic. I use them in the majority of my emails. And the PS is normally 
something I've read about the person on their website, something I've read about them on social media that's positive, something I've seen about them on LinkedIn, or something I know about them, I always have it as a PS at the end. And a PS is an amazing way of getting a response. When most people reply to my emails, weirdly enough, they comment in the PS first. So this is how you write effective emails. Always have the person's name, share advice, keep it succinct and to the point, don't talk about yourself, have a PS at the end. And by the way, this is more of a generational thing. But if you're selling to people over the age of 40, 45, you've got to have a phone number and a website. You can't just have your email. My daughter's generation will buy off anybody. <laughs> they will. They don't need your phone number or your email. But my generation, we want phone numbers, we want websites. That's how we buy. Now, majority of people when they send emails do not follow up. This surprises and shocks me all the time. It takes between three and 12 touch points in business. Between three and 12 touch points in business to get a deal. And most people send one email and give up. So you always gotta have a follow up. Now, when you follow up, <laughs> never say that ever. Say things like, I sent you my original email, chances are you were too busy to read it because I understand the world of a business owner. And I say this a lot because you've got to let people know you understand them and you have to let people know that you get them. And then I remind them of the benefits of working with me and the value I give. I don't talk about myself, but I remind them of the value I give. This is really important. Most people don't follow up. And by the way, when you follow up, always include the original email. Because if you email me a week ago, I can guarantee you I will have completely forgotten what you've said already. Because I've had thousands of emails in the last week. Um, a lot of people now, this is a very American thing, it's happening in the UK and Northern Ireland at the moment. People are sending emails saying, last attempt, last try. Never send emails like that. Because if you do, you will never do business with somebody again, okay? And this is, this is the most common thing I'm seeing right now. It's been happening for 11 months and it's not stopping. And people do it to get your attention. It doesn't work. Also, never ask somebody for a five minute call unless you know them very well. Every business call takes at least 15, 20 minutes. So this is emails. I just have a sign, Ruth, is that right? Okay, so networking. I plan to make this really interactive, but as usual, I talk too much, so I'm not gonna do that. I will say when it comes to networking events, the biggest mistake to avoid is walking up to somebody saying, hi, what do you do? And the reason it's the biggest mistake is because everybody does it, and also, some people find it quite defensive. Um, the smartest thing you can do is walk up to somebody you don't know and say, hi, what brought you here today? I do this with everybody. Now, for those of you who are scared of networking, about 40% of my customers are introverts. And they cannot think of anything worse <laughs> than attending a networking event, really. For them, it's just pure terror. And last night, I went to the Ulster Museum for the Rising uh, Startup Awards in Northern Ireland. And Gareth and Lop, you're going to hear speak afterwards, I met him there after 20 minutes. But when I walked in, I didn't know a single soul. Never walk up to large groups of people. It's quite intimidating. What I do is I spoke to the organizers saying, look, hi, I'm so happy to be here. I don't know anybody. Who can I talk to? And organizers want to make you feel welcome. They want you to have a good time because you're going to come back or you're going to tell people about it. They didn't just be the photographer. I spoke to him for five minutes. He got put on stage and like, oh God, who do I talk to? I found somebody by themselves, went, hi, I'm there. And she goes, oh, I know you from LinkedIn. And we ended up chatting. When you see people by themselves at networking events, it just means they're a bit shy or they're a bit introvert. And they want to fit in, but they don't really know what to say. So chances are they're looking at their phone. Go ahead and approach them. It's one of the best things you can do. Today, I walked up and down that aisle twice, and I was really impressed how people were getting on with other people. But I also noticed loads of people on their phones and their laptops. Almost half my business revenue is based on people I've met at networking events and done business with. So please use today, use the breaks today. I know sometimes you have to check email, but try to meet as many people as you can, ask some good questions and build relationships because you have no idea where it's gonna lead in the future. Okay, the two most common kinds of objections you get in business are price and call me back in six months. So when somebody gives you a price objection, the biggest mistake people make is they start talking about themselves and saying, well, yes, we're more expensive, but here's why, and here's what we do, and here's what we do, and they talk themselves out of a deal. That's the most common thing I see all the time. If someone has a price objection, just take a step back, slow things down. 
It's really important to do that. Don't start talking, slow things down. We're expensive, okay. Compared to who? Okay, that's interesting. And what's that person offering? Brilliant, okay. And then you start having a discussion again. You gotta take things a step back before you go a step forward. When it comes to discounting, the biggest companies in the world for discounting and asking for discounts are India, population of one billion, China, population of over a billion, and Northern Ireland. <laughs> Everybody in Northern Ireland wants a discount, they do. I was quite shocked when I came back two years ago and everybody wanted a discount. Um, and I would say, well, compared to whom? And I would ask questions. And I don't win every deal. I don't. Because not everybody is my customer. And that's it's very important for you to understand that. But when you're talking about price especially, be aware of your body language. Be very aware of how fast you speak. Because people tend to speak much faster. And if you can't come to an agreement, which sometimes happens, you've got two, a few choices. One is you go, this person's not my customer. You wish them the best, you walk away. The second thing you can do is say, you know what, there's a lot to take on board here. Can you give me 24 hours and I'll come back to you? Not a lot of people do this. It's okay. If you, if you spent an hour talking to somebody and you've had a long day and you can't think of an answer, just say, look, let me have a think about this. I'll come back to you tomorrow. The third thing I'll do is when I've got a proposal of things I'm working with people on, I just take stuff away. So, okay, I'll take this session away. I'll take this away. I'll take this bonus away. Now I can meet your budget. And they either panic and go back to the original price or they accept it. So these are just various ways of dealing with price objections. And the other, and this is actually very important, we're not ready yet, or call us back in six months. If somebody says I'm not ready yet, call me back in December. The worst thing you can do is call in December. Because when you call back in December, they will have forgotten who you are completely, or you've got to start all over again. And it's a pain and you've wasted time. If someone asks you to call back in December, say, look, I'm happy to do that. It's so much, it's six months away, it's so long away. Would it be okay if I kept in touch with you just once a week, I'll send you valuable content, I promise not to spam you. About 60% of people will say yes. Those are your potential customers. 40% will say no, they'll never be your customer. So keep in touch with people, that's very, very important. Also make sure you're doing stuff like liking and commenting on their social media posts as well. Okay, last part, LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the second fastest social media app in the world after TikTok. TikTok has grown explosive rates, but for B2B, LinkedIn is still the biggest in the world. Uh, it's where your future customers are as well as your current customers are. And as I mentioned a few times, there's a lot of things I mentioned a few times because they're very important. One is standing out, one is the quality of your network. I am here today speaking on stage because Ruth, uh, Ruth Robinson spoke to somebody saying, who would you recommend? and he recommended me, I know him from LinkedIn. The power of your network is incredible. You'll be amazed how much business you get from people just by being a good human being that helps other people. Now, there's a few things to do on LinkedIn. The first thing is optimize your profile. Now these are very quick punchy headlines because a LinkedIn session takes 90 minutes, okay? So optimize your profile, help other businesses. This is very important, not many people do this. Help other businesses. I spend more time helping other people on LinkedIn with problems, supporting other people, rooting for other people, congratulating other people than I do writing content. This is very important. Write content that is valuable to people. Notice I, I didn't say write content that's world class. My content's not world class. I'm not a brilliant writer, but it's valuable to other people. Do personal posts because that is how you scale big. Be consistent and use video. These are the things I did to scale very, very quickly on LinkedIn. So, your profile, the first thing people see is this. It's the first thing anybody sees. So make sure it's clean, make sure it's easy to read. Remember the image I showed you at the beginning about your, your customer being overwhelmed all day long on social media? Overwhelmed all day long with calls and meetings. Make life as easy for them as you possibly can. Always have your website address, your logo isn't that important. Tell people what you do and make sure they have a way of contacting you. But this is very important. Now, the about section is key. Most people don't say enough in their about section or they waffle on too much when they say cliched things like, I'm a people person, I'm passionate about my job. Again, stand out. My headline, nobody in the world has. Nobody I can guarantee in the world says what I say. That's what it's about. It's about standing out. 
That's really important. And again, there's loads of white space. It's very easy to read. Notice I've used emojis. I started using emojis last September because nobody in my sector was using them. <laughs> it actually works really well. Um, and again, it stands out. It's about standing out. It's about being different. And then have a call to action. And then this is really important here. Tell people something personal about you. People do business with people they like and trust. And people want to know who you are behind your job title. Tell them who you are. Tell them what you enjoy doing in your free time. Majority of people who contact me ask about me being a rock drummer, which I love playing drums in a rock band. Or they ask about my ridiculous, every November, all you see from me are pictures of handlebar mustaches while I raise money for, for cancer. But this is what I do every year. And it's how people connect with you. And then have your call to action at the very end. Contact me by email or text me or email me or call me. However it is you want to be contacted. But this is what an about section is. It does take a little bit of time to, to get the about section right. It will take you 15, 20 minutes. Um, and the last part of the profile, I've only chosen the most important bits here, are testimonials. <coughs> when you go on holiday, what do you do? You ask friends or family for advice or you look on TripAdvisor. You go out to eat at a restaurant, you look online. You buy stuff from Amazon, you look at the reviews. You uh, want to look at a business, you look at Google reviews. People look at reviews. Social proof matters. And the amount of business I won last year because my competition had five reviews and I had 45 was incredible. Whenever you win a deal, always ask the person, why did I win? And when you lose a deal, always ask the person, why did I lose so I can improve? And when I win deals, it's because I have a lot of testimonials and because I'm an easy person to talk to and I'm trustworthy. That's it. Those are really simple skills to develop. So please start asking people for testimonials. Okay. Last bit here, last bit's coming up. Your network, promote them and support them as much as you can. If you want to raise your profile on LinkedIn, like and comment on people's posts. Don't just like a post, it has zero effect. When you like and comment on somebody's post, it raises their profile, it raises your profile and you get noticed. So please do it. Five words or more is what the LinkedIn algorithm likes. Uh, the best time to post used to be in the morning, but since lockdown it's now lunchtime. I never share posts, they get no engagement. So many people share because it's easy, but doing what is easiest isn't always the best. Now, the two kinds of posts you can write, business experience, where you just talk about what you're doing every day in the world, and that's absolutely fine, it's a good thing to do, or personal posts. My personal post is how you scale a business and it's how you grow a business. It's how you scale a business and it's how you grow a business. So the personal posts that I did, which really helped me scale big, one is doing video, because video makes you an authority on everything. Even if you're not an authority, you sound like one, <laughs> okay? 60% of people watch LinkedIn with a sound off. Please have subtitles. Uh, you can use rev.com, which is the cheapest. I think Clips, if you have Apple. I use Subtitle, which is 14 pound a month, but again, I use Subtitle because it's easy. It's Subtitle with a Z. Um, if you're nervous about video, which a lot of people are, look at your vision board. That's what the vision board is for. And imagine you're talking to a friend. This is really important. Headlines are key. Anytime you do a post on LinkedIn, having a headline matters more than you can possibly imagine because it stops people in their tracks. 60 seconds is all you need. I see people doing 60 minute podcasts and 30 minute podcasts and putting it on LinkedIn, that never works. Nobody's gonna take 30 minutes or 60 minutes out of their day to, to, to watch something you've done, unless it's your best friend or a family member. 60 seconds is what you want. Now, I have ran over, so I'm gonna go through this in literally 30 seconds. Personal posts, what can you talk about? You can talk about it when you've lost a loved one. Those posts do well. Here, and I've deliberately put this here for a reason. I put the view counts and the impressions deliberately so you can see it. Um, this is really important. This is me not seeing my daughter for almost a year because of lockdown. It was heartbreaking. I was reunited with her and it went through the roof. I'm gonna tell you why in a second these personal posts matter. This is my father. This was the biggest post that day on LinkedIn. My mother's best friend got cancer. She couldn't get an appointment at the hospital. He called every cancer doctor in Northern Ireland because he's insane. <laughs> and he called 18 doctors and made an appointment with her. And that's a very powerful personal post. Um, and the last one was the biggest post on New Year's Day on LinkedIn. 
This was me after three years of online dating, getting stood up, being rejected, being catfished, going through a nightmare as a middle-aged man trying to do online dating. Finally, I met somebody and fell in love. It was amazing. And that posted 874,000 views. Now, that's all nice, but here's the results with personal posts. You get more followers, increased branding, you build trust quicker, you humanize yourself, and people start to follow you on LinkedIn. So, that is it for today. Please make a note of five things you're gonna do as a result of today. That's the most important thing. And then tomorrow, please take action on those five. Normally we would share results, but what I'm gonna do is during the lunch break, I'm gonna, and during the break now, I'm gonna be approaching all of you and asking, okay, how are you getting on? What are you gonna do as a result of this, okay? Uh, LinkedIn, there's about 100 videos you can keep learning from. Just subscribe to it, and I will be happy to answer any questions during the break. Is that okay, Ruth? Because I've gone over a bit time-wise. Apologies for that. Um, everybody, thank you so, so much for your time. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm particularly interesting. So let, let me just introduce the three guests uh, from left to right. Um, Sean McDermott from Lochtech, John Ross Armstrong from Greentown Environmental, and last but not least, Caroline McMahon from Hidden Hair and B. Almay. Got that right? Close. Almay. Almay. <laughs> See, I was so busy concentrating on the May me thing, I got the Al bit wrong. <laughs> anyway, right. Um, look, welcome to all of you, um, and thanks very much for um, taking the challenge to come and sit up here. And, uh, and talk about yourselves and the difficulties that you face and, and, and the positive things as well. Let, let's just, for the benefit of people, some folks in the audience will know who you are and know what you do and some people might not be sure precisely what you do and um, what the challenges in your particular sector might be. So, Sean, do you want to say a little bit about the background to Loctec, first of all, just in a minute or two? Mm -hmm. what, what does Loctec do and um, how has it grown in the last number of years? So thanks, Mark. Uh, Labtech, um, we're an IT company. We specialise in managed services, secure work from home solutions, which got quite trendy over the last couple of years. And uh, we have a specialism for cyber security. Um, established in 2006, employed 20 people based here in the town. Um, we've worked probably all over the globe in the last five, six years. So that's, um, I mean, from, 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 a, from a timing point of view, uh, you probably couldn't be in a better sector um, for the challenges we had to face over the last couple of years. Is that is that fair to say? There's a statement out there that, that says that you have to, to become an expert in something, you have to do it uh, 10,000 times. And um, David Lee Roth of Van Halen says it's 30,000 times. It sort of felt like to me at the start of lockdown that we'd been getting ready for COVID for 16 years without knowing it. So we were in an incredibly, an incredibly good, strong position to continue to function. Mm. Um, and and just when what's your background? How how did you come to set up the company in two thousand and six? So I, I worked for a, a local company, Foil Food Group Meat Production Company. Uh, they have a site here in Oma. Um, I suppose university dropout. Uh, was very lucky to get a job in there, and then was fortunate enough to work with a lot of really smart people over fifteen or sixteen years. Technology became a thing in the industry, and uh, I was the one that showed the most interest, so I started to train and learn a lot about IT. And 17 or 18 years ago, um, I decided that I would like a new challenge. I like, loved the time I had in FOIL, but I just needed something fresh to do. And I suppose they say that you know, as you, as you grow older, you've actually become the man you always were. So I'm still holding on, trying to become the best version of myself. <laughs> That's very honest. <laughs> um, um, John Ross, what, what's been the experience at, uh, at Greentown Environmental then? Yeah, um, Greentown started in 2010, uh, so 12 years ago now. Um, started as a new startup, um, despite my wife trying to talk me out of it. Um, so 12 years on, we have we employ 180 staff, um, started the other side of Inniskill in Florence Court. So location-wise, you couldn't get a more rural area. Um, the caves, uh, so Marble Arch Road. We have five different depots, Macrofelt, Lisburn, Dublin and Dundalk. Uh, the services that we do is drainage works, grounds maintenance, we control all 80% public, public sector works and then we have a traffic management business as well. Um, 
eighty percent public sector. Yeah. Uh, is that a good thing, or yeah, does that it's good bring security and good challenges? Yeah, you wouldn't say anything bad about the public sector. No. but if you ask me afterwards, <laughs> I'll, I'll speak more honestly. <laughs> Well, a lot of businesses, I suppose, in Northern Ireland are dependent on the, on the public sector, aren't yeah. they? Um, it should be guaranteed steady work, shouldn't it? But um, as the economy changes and faces different challenges, um, yeah. you've, you've got to be fleet of foot to deal with some of those, don't you? Yeah. Um, they have a great opportunities. Um, with, with being a smaller business at the start, and we still have that ethos, um, during COVID, the, you know, the larger... The public sector, the in-house services were very slow to react, so we reacted quickly and I think we gained within the space of the start of COVID to over 18 months. We employed 80 extra staff and it was very, uh, we picked up really good staff that were going over to England and we've managed to uh, retain them. And so there was an opportunity with, with, with that as well. Do you still feel like a local company? Do you f still feel that you're rooted oh, in this part Anna, of the country? Yeah. From yeah. Anaman, yeah, that doesn't leave you. So that'll never change? No, when I'm in Belfast, uh, I'm, I'm told them I'm Donegal, and then when I tell them from Fermanagh, they tell them, is that in the north? So, no, I'm definitely well, a Fermanagh person. Belfast are, yeah. are very stupid. Uh, <laughs> Mark I, I, I often tell my children that. I come from Limavady, and uh, I always say to my children, I feel sorry for you that you're from Belfast, so I, I can understand your sentiment, John Frost. Um, was there some kind of magic moment? Was, was there something that suddenly happened within the company that just unlocked the, that potential? You said you started off in 2010 as a small startup. Is there a point you would look at and say that that's where things changed? The biggest, the, the biggest hurdle for any startup is to make that transition from a, a subcontractor to a principal contractor. So every uh, the procurement is stacked against the smaller operators because we, we, we find it hard to give assurance to the public sector. Um, so everything there was a, everything we went to do was a hurdle, but we had a plan to make that step up. For example, we were te our first tenders, we were having to give, we couldn't get the work unless we could give an example of experience of being a principal contractor and how do you get that. Yeah. So we, we were able to go to lesser thresholds uh, contracts and, and go about it, but there was hurdles along the way. But if I look back, that's the biggest transition, and that's the hardest transition. Um, owner operators, smaller companies are better at doing the work than the bigger organisations in a smaller way. But it's that transition then to to, to actually t get the contracts direct. But then you need to guard against becoming too big for your own good, yeah. don't you? That's you. You've got to always what retain that personal. Touch. Yeah, we, we were, we, that was an advantage of ours. We were a small fish in a big pond and our cost base was a lot less. But um, if you go into our head office in Florence Court, there's, a, a, there's a, a question, the whole thing, when it, there's 20 staff between four garages that you, you can't charge for. Um, and that's geared to certain customers. So we've had to make tough decisions. The customers that took us so far, we've had to let them go and, and move away from them. And we just couldn't work for the, the, the businesses that we worked for in the first four years, we couldn't work for them now and because we're pricing against owner operators. So we've had to change our customers to suit um, the overheads that we have. Right. Um, Caroline, tell us about Hidden Hair and B. Alme. Spot on. Spot on. Spot on. Good, good, good. Um, Hidden Hair, so I started it um, when I was out in Australia. I was out in Australia, I moved out in 2012 and I fell into the trap of visas and got stuck in a job that I didn't love. So once I got my residency then, I started my own business and the whole hidden hair concept come from, it was like an upstairs warehouse that had no signage on the outside. So literally when you booked your appointment, then you got the address of the location. So that's where the whole hidden hair come out of. Um, but I ran that for two and a half years and absolutely loved it. If I didn't plan to come home, that would have been like my final destination. I was very happy where I was, but home is where the heart is. Where if anyone has been away, you always come back home. So I sold the business out in Australia and then come home and set it up here in Donegmore. Um, it was a big transition setting up in Donegmore because the way I was used to working out in Australia wasn't really the way that people worked here. And a lot of things that I come across was people saying like that won't work. People don't like change here, you know. I had no phone, um, I only done colours, so like I didn't do like, you know, walk-ins, I didn't do dry trims, so it was really like 
foreign compared to the hairdresser and that um, was here at the time but um, the business grew, um, probably grew and maybe I wasn't ready for it to grow. I only intended to have one and then I ended up with nine so um, it probably grew quicker than I was ever ready for but um, then I got into Bialmai so it was something I started in Australia. I recognised when I was away that no person had like an interchangeable curling wand, so that's where that idea come from. So I came home with my prototype and then got stuck in and finally then launched that now two years in September. And for the benefit of those of us who haven't been able to or required the services of it, <laughs> you need to just, to, I think the three of us are feeling slightly out of it here, just explain exactly what, what, what that service is. Well, basically, if you have um, wives, girlfriends, or daughters, um, my service is definitely one that you would like. But um, so basically, it's a hair curling tongue, and an interchangeable product means that you can take off one attachment and put on another. So when I was in Australia, um, there was actually no company like the biggest companies that there is to date. No company had one tool that you could take off the end and put on another. So you had to basically buy two tools. So I was obviously the first that to come home with this idea, but obviously challenges come up with being the only person in the business at the time. So in my head, the time frame got a lot longer. So I never actually got it out quick enough to be the first, but in my head, I still know I was the first, so, so that's so, enough for me. So uh, you're doing two things, are you? Yeah, I'm so, saying. I, so you're providing a service, and are you also manufacturing yes, as manufacturing, well? manufacturing, yeah. So we do um, export. So I'm a full-time hairdresser, and um, I'm a hairdresser by heart. Like, I've been in the industry from the age of 16, so that's all I've ever known. I love doing hair. Um, obviously, anyone that's maybe doing a manual job, like my hands wouldn't be the best, like I'm only 33, so like long term, I know that it's not my forever, even though it's obviously like got me, you know, so far, and I absolutely love it, but this is where Bialmi's come out of, so that's like my, my end goal, is to be able to, you know, do the online side of it, so yeah, I work in a salon 45 hours a week, and I also run um, Bialmi. And give us some sense of the, the scale of Bialme. I mean, what, how, <clears throat> what, whatever numbers you want to throw at us, but that is obviously a significant operation as well. Yeah, so um, Bialme again, um, like it's a constant learning. Like anyone who has been exporting goods, like the challenges that that business has faced and what I've learned over the last two years has been unbelievable. Um, when you think you know it, like you'll be sure that you won't know it because something will come up like that'll just throw that out of the water and you have to start again. So you have COVID, you have Brexit, you have, you know, shipping times, containers are through the roof. So, you know, this year I've actually spent just reevaluating the business and basically starting again. Um in my own head, obviously I don't tell my customers that, but um really just reevaluating and like I feel like I'm actually understanding the business whereas when I started I thought it was just a matter of sitting on my phone and selling my products you know yes it was going well I am in like a number of pharmacies around the north and the south um probably about maybe 20 pharmacies so um you know from the outside looking in the business has, has been going great and yes it has but you know there's been a lot of learning curves obviously with if you take shipping prices and then you multiply it by four you know you're really having to reevaluate your costing and um, now we're getting into the stage that we need like warehouse to store our products now and I come across a big hurdle last year of my products not arriving in time for Christmas so that was a lovely Christmas present for everybody who didn't get it but um, you know it's just been as I say it's been a learning curve and I think that if anybody thinks they know it all they definitely, they definitely don't. But you we were just chatting beforehand and you were saying you found um, this project really really helpful the academy was a very yeah. helpful process to go through what what i mean what did you learn do you think what was most useful so i would probably say just like i'm just one of them ones that i just don't understand like the figure side of it yes anybody who's like spreadsheet like i wouldn't even know what a spreadsheet is that's just me being honest like i can the business looks successful in paper and i'm like great that's happy but i don't understand the figure side of it so going through this program has really made me like start from the start and actually understand that like you know it's not good enough just knowing that your business is successful you actually have to know like your bottom figure so I wouldn't have understood that process and again just working through the program like 
you know, you learn from people and everybody can help you in a different area. So I've been, been put in touch with loads of people that have really um, helped me along the way. So just perfected the business and it's not just about selling. You have to um, understand your profit margins and um, all of the, the boring stuff, as I'd call it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is very important <laughs> yes, um, to the is. bottom line. It and, is. And, and you brought us back to the, to the whole point about, about sales because this... The academy uh, is about sales, and the conference today is about driving sales yeah. as well. Sean, what, um, the point was made earlier on um, that sometimes businesses are, are, are reticent about selling, they're nervous about selling, or they don't know how to do it properly. What, how did you approach the challenge of selling a product? I mean, it's okay to start up a company and employ people and offer a service, but then it's a different thing to actually go out proactively and sell that service, isn't it? Yeah, I, look, I would be the opposite. I, I love a spreadsheet. My, my actual disk analysis you know, know. says that I like a spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, so I'd be very conscious of the numbers. I suppose I have a, a bit of an accountancy background from uh, the beef industry. I was very well mentored in there by a guy called Paddy McElroy. Um, so when we, st we had absolutely no plan to do sales at all, Mark. None. Right. Um, and we've learned really tough, hard lessons. Um, sales wise we bought two nice desks and we just thought it would happen um, and that's not, that's not the way it happened you think people would come looking for you yeah, obviously right. and I still think that you know, I'm delusional to the end yeah. um, I, I read somewhere and I've told a few people today that uh, during the um, Amber Heard uh, situation over the last few weeks in Johnny Depp that there were 18 billion social media interactions on that, you know, and to me, that's during a period of time when there's a cost of living crisis. We've got a war going on in Ukraine, um, and I find that a bit strange. But I can't ignore that fact. Yeah. So we 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 live in a world now where perceptions reality, unfortunately. Um, so you know how we build our social media profile. Biggest lesson is probably getting outside your comfort zone. You know, uh, the biggest couple of moments for me were. I did a presentation to Glaxo Smith Plain and um, in 2019, which was so far in my comfort zone, it's not real. And I changed the way that they think about cybersecurity and parts of their organisation. Um, I also had the surreal experience of doing a presentation in Spanish from my landing in Loch Macquarie to the Chilean Secret Service um, during lockdown. Uh, now, I don't speak Spanish, so I had to get someone to give me a hand with that. So, was really ch I think there's a lot of things have changed there. For us as a business, like we did a project for GSK in Zebulon, North Carolina, from Dremore during lockdown. So, you know, just because you're in Florence Court doesn't matter anymore. That's changed forever as an employer and as, as employees, as, as young students graduating. So now, like, you can work anywhere in the world that you want to. Well, for whoever you want to. That, the whole idea of peripherality has changed as we move more and more of our um, business exchanges online, presumably. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world. Who knew that a firm from this part of the world would be dealing with the Chilean secret service? Who knew there was a Chilean secret service? If you lived in Santiago, you would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, probably, you probably shouldn't say any more at this stage, I would have thought. Yeah. Uh, but, no, but anyway, that wasn't the disadvantage uh, as far it, as the Chileans it probably were was, concerned. It, it, was like, it was a self limiting belief that I had. Yeah. So we would have had a brass plate in London. We had a brass plate in Dublin. I don't need that. You were very capable. Like, why do you think all these big cybersecurity companies are coming over here from America? You know, we, we've got the talent. We've got the knowledge. Probably a wee bit of a, you know, um, a lot to do with the troubles, what went on here for 30-odd years. We, uh, we, we were not very... Uh, assertive in terms of what we're capable of ourselves um, and you know I suppose all the big changes for me would be you know continuous development so I left school you know when I was 20 and I thought that was it you know now I'm continuously reading books uh, you know taking mentors into the business uh, trying to you know deliver a culture of continuous change continuous improvement um, you know out meet people um, get new ideas uh, just keep the, the whole thing rolling. Like, you know, COVID was like the, the wind was blowing. So you, you have two options there. You either build walls or windmills. Mm. You know, we maybe not by design, but we built a windmill that, that worked very well during the And are the you much time. less reticent now about selling? Are you much more confident about going out there and <sighs> telling people 
what Loctec is and what you do and why you're the company to work with? So uh, we've sort of went full circle there. So during that early uh, period, the first thing was we'd won a half million pound contract on the living room again, or on the, on the landing again. It's a good place, but we should relocate there permanently. So we've worked on that for two years and we, we, we have some really large enterprise customers that we do very specific cyber security solutions for. Uh, the likes of GlaxoSmithKline, Sage, Schneider Electric. It's, like it's, it's a bit ridiculous, me saying this small company no matter dealing with these really big enterprise customers, yeah. the Chinese National Offshore Oil Corporation. But we've, we're doing a, like a, almost a 360 now because there's a huge danger for every single business that exists now with cybercrime. So we have a new partner now and we're up, able to offer a, a cost-effective solution that monitors networks, IT networks, 24 7 365. So we're able to offer that to the clients locally that made us famous in the first place. Mm -hmm. John Ross, what about the challenge of, of selling Greentown environmental services? I mean, was that something you dealt with head on or were you reluctant to do that? Were you uncomfortable about that? Did you have to sit yeah. down and learn how to do it more effectively? We did put the best in and they did come. <laughs> Where'd you get them there? Yeah. Um, no, we started off very small, and just like Caroline, Caroline says, she's she's not a spreadsheet woman, and you're continuing. I took a different strategy. I am I employed was weak. That's why I have so many employees. And, uh, and I'm, you're never going to know every element. And what the services I needed to get started was being good at weed spraying and being good at grass cutting, and that's what I started doing. There were seven employees the first year. And we employ our own solicitor now, we employ our own uh, HR manager, services that I couldn't afford at the start, but got away without them. And, you know, it comes a time when you need to, you, you try and grow up big enough that you're, that you can afford and bring that, that knowledge in the business, and that's, that's the way it's been. And, and what about selling the services? Did you, I mean, so people came, but presumably you also have to tender to big public yes. bodies, do you? Yeah. I mean... We, we were... From the outset, we were we were good at tender, right? And we improved it, and we um, we brought consultants in where we could, and kept improving, improving. So you looked for expertise, yeah, right? And but we've all my background in the job that I don't I, I was doing before I started, um, it was tendering as well. So I had that, we had that at the offset, and uh, yeah, you need to be good at tendering for, and it's easier if you're if if any, 70, 80 percent of your work is in the public sector if you're only doing. You're only doing thirty percent. You can, if you can just, if you're geared up for the public sector, you can just go after the tendering market. Um, the social media, the LinkedIn, and we're not as good at that because we've we've went down the public sector. So we need to we need to diversify and be open to other markets. Um, but what I mean, there are two things you've got to do. Then you've got to be able to tender effectively. Yeah. Um, but you then have to deliver on that tender. There's mm -hmm. no point in winning a big contract and then under delivering because yeah. when it comes for renewal, it's yeah. not going to be renewed. Yeah. So you've, you've got to be successful um, on the technical side of getting the contract and then you have to also do the work that you say you're going to do. Yeah, we, if we put it down in paper, we're going to do it, we're going to deliver it and, and um, if we tell you we're going to shoot you, you have to buy the coffin. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to see it through. And is that, and that, but presumably, on, I mean, the serious point there is that that must have got harder as costs are increasing. Um, is is the ability to be competitive more challenging? Yes, and no. Um, if the service is right and your cost, it's not a market that um, our competitors. And it, if 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 you have a, a service and you have it and it's priced and, you, and you've been doing it right from the bottom, the, um, the cost isn't isn't that you can get it in the tender and it's it's not the biggest it's not the biggest factor. Right. Sounds like you've got some magic formula that you're hinting <laughs> yeah. at, but you're not going to share it with us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it kind of got easier. Is that a fair point? Um. It's. For me, it's probably easier the last four or five years than it even had, had been. Even with a bit years of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, we had a lot, with we had the a lot of growth. cost of living crisis, where prices are going up, still okay. Yeah, we have the protection of if if it's public 
contract you have uh, price fluctuations so if, if diesel and uh, costs go up then your, your price goes up accordingly which is very fortunate but yeah. um, we're, we're also in, in the last year we gave notice on contracts that we had uh, there were seven year contracts and we were four years in and that was a big decision to do and um, we, we, we give nine months notice on a contract that, and we were willing to roll the dice and let it go out to retender because just things had changed that much and inflation, what, what was perceived as inflation didn't match the reality of, of inflation so it's looking be, be making brave decisions like that and go right we're going to let that contract go out to tender mm -hmm. and just the costs have went too dear on it. And two examples that we've did that, we've won it back at a lot better rate. Right. So that's about knowing your business and, mm -hmm. no. as you say, making brave yeah. decisions. And you're looking at the market and, and who's out there and who will take the work on and um, and making that decision, right, I'm willing to let this go out to tender and right. re-tender it because our business, is complete, our overheads are completely different than what they would be three years ago or two years ago. Yeah. And so constantly your costs is going changing. Caroline, what about sales as far as as you're concerned? You said you, you, you're a hairdresser through and through. Yes. So you don't have to presumably push that because people no. do come to you. Is that <clears throat> fair to say? Yeah, so basically since I left Donald Moore, which is... So in, in lockdown, I kind of reevaluated my business and stripped that business back because, you know... From, again, from the outside looking in, you think like as the staff grow that your bottom line's going to grow, but for me it was the complete opposite. So by stripping my business back and starting again, it's a lot more profitable now than it ever was, um, going from nine staff down now to three staff. So that was a major learning curve for me, but again, no regrets. Everything is an experience, and I think you have to make the errors till be able to reevaluate and that's why lockdown was actually a good thing for me because it gave me the time to change the things that in the middle of a busy week that I probably didn't have the time to change. Um, but sales wise, even though I am a hairdresser, I actually was one of them weird ones that didn't even have a bottle of shampoo in the salon. Like I despise sales um, because I always hated that where you go into like get like a facial or something done, these men won't understand this, but um, where they'd start to like talk about products and like write them down. Like I hate that pressure. I like, you know, more natural sales. I like people to buy because they want something. I don't like having to push something um, on somebody. But um, during lockdown, actually myself and another hairdresser, we kind of recognised the fact that everybody was going to be sitting at home with nothing to do. This was just at the start of the first lockdown. Um, and you know when you're from that background where you can't sit still for too long that was just my worst nightmare so we decided to do an online um, training course so that actually brought in about 800 hairdressers from all around um, the world so I suppose then from that side of it we were selling our online hair course so that was the start of the sales um, for me then during lockdown that we were constantly pushing these courses that we started to do then during that period so were you, were you comfortable with that sales yeah, aspect of the business i was because I've, you're used to using your phone and um it's one of them things like it's like everything if if it's scared you you would you would never do it like you just have to put yourself out there i don't think anybody naturally like i am so scared sitting up here right now you have no idea you know this is new for me actually sitting talking in front of people but um like i like to put it out there and with instagram it's the click of a button, it's people's choice if they want to buy, so you're not actually forcing things on people. Um, so that's the kind of sales that I like. And then when I come to be Alma, I can sit and style my own hair and it's up to people if they want to click the button and buy. You're not, you know, going round door to door trying to actually sell your product. Right, so you found a way to sell that you are comfortable with? Yes. Where you can push your expertise and your knowledge, is that yes, fair to say? Yes, definitely. Giving people the option and I suppose it's like everything, it's recognising who your actual clientele are. Whenever I started Bialmi, I would have been like thinking young people were my clientele, meaning like the, you know, the people that get inspired by, you know, what they see. But like now, two years in, I actually realise that they're not, you know, my customers because the really young teenage age group are so... 
inspired by the likes of your Molly Mays, people that you can never, do you know who Molly May are? I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking at no, me blankly. <laughs> um, so like influencers, like people that you just can't keep up with. So I've just separated myself from that and I don't compare myself to businesses that I'm just not in the same line. I think like if you always compare yourself to people, you know, put that effort into um, your own business and, you know, you have to start somewhere. So I recognise now that my actual customers are people sitting at home that can't style their own hair mm -hmm. they are the people that i target and that's why i sit now and do like my demonstrations and once people then can see that it's not as hard as it looks then that's when they buy so so and those social media platforms are very important to you without a doubt my business wouldn't run without instagram like right. i don't actually use facebook as much um it's very hard when you're just one person you know doing all these um separate social medias but Literally, um, Instagram runs um, by Almy, and then when it comes to hidden hair, it's constantly fully booked. So I was saying earlier that from my move from Dunhamore two years ago, I've never to go on any new clients, so my clientele is full in hidden hair. So that makes that business very easy to run. So I'm not actually trying to grow that business. Right. Could you just say the three of us know who Molly May is, but we're not prepared to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that right? Secretly, I've seen that twinkle in your eyes. So yeah. I don't. You can just tell, can't you? Um, <laughs> It's, 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 it's hard to think of three, three businesses that could be more different and facing more different challenges and your experiences have been so different but it's also interesting just to see the, the, the parallels and the similar experiences um, in dealing with the challenges of selling. So it's very interesting to hear your perspectives. I'm, I don't want to hog this. Um, does any, anybody want to pick up on any particular aspect of what we've heard so, so far? Niraj, I, do you mind if I just bring you in at this point? Because I just, I just wonder what you make of what you've just heard. Because I'm desperately trying to compare these three experiences to your template from earlier. I mean, in terms of ticking the boxes of what people should be doing, broadly speaking, <laughs> broadly speaking, are, are the three contributors getting things right, do you think? There's a microphone. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Um, well, Caroline and I... Our best friends, and all we ever do is talk about hair extension. So yeah, I, I mean that's. <laughs> it, it's nice to meet people because the idea today, I think, for everybody is, we all have our own knowledge and our own expertise. And what I hope everybody does is take something unique from everybody, because everybody has different experiences. Um, I was lucky enough; I spoke to Sean during the break, so I learned a lot about how he does things. And Sean's way of doing things is the way I would probably do things. Whereas John Ross, I literally connect with him like a week ago on LinkedIn, so I haven't had a chance to talk to him enough yet, but I can't wait to. With Caroline, my ex-partner ran a beauty salon for 20 years, so I understand facials and Molly Men. I understand the whole industry. I understand Jessica Nails. Every time laser hair removal machines are being done, my arm is a guinea pig. So I understand that industry very well. I like how she said that I don't like to push people to sell. I want them to come to me. At the same time, Caroline's very charismatic. Not everybody is that easy going and approachable. And that's something you work on through self-development and personal development. But I would buy off you because you have that personality and easygoing nature. And one thing I said in my talk is people buy from people they like and trust. Yeah. And that's a huge part of sales. It is. But it, but it is interesting to hear... Uh, people saying there is that reticence, that reluctance about selling, that feeling that you're you're pushing a product on people who don't necessarily want to buy it, and if you do that too much, it might be counterproductive. <coughs> it's presumably about it's about finding a balance, is it? Striking the right balance for you and for your company and your product. It is. I always say to people because everybody, as a business owner, you want to make money to pay off your loans and pay the bills. So it's understandable sometimes you might you might feel the urge to sell. And my advice to everybody, and I've made this mistake in the past as well, by the way, my advice to everybody is help as many people as possible because that makes the selling process really, really easy. Mm. Very, yeah, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Does anybody, any, anybody else want to pick up on anything? With a, just a, there you go, just right beside Naraj. Right. Yeah, uh, John McKenna, uh, just to a point on what Naraj said earlier, when we're talking about pricing, for example, and sometimes you might have to dance with somebody a little bit, but there's a lot of people out there who aren't your customer. And each person that has a business here is in existence because some people do need it. And so our job is really to try and find the people who actually do need it, who actually, whose world you actually are helping, rather than trying to force somebody to buy something or, or really desperately encourage them. If you can identify who needs what you have and it's unique enough, then that becomes your biggest job and then the sales bit nearly becomes naturally. It's just you're helping them, making their world easier. 
So that, that can be a way of looking at selling as not trying to push stuff, but just trying to help people. And it, it really helps all of us. And, and, and when we're going out there and saying, there's people out there that need what we, it's just my job to try and find them. Yeah, but, and, and that um, audience that you're looking for, or that, that potential um, sales target is different for every individual, different for every business. And um, obviously Instagram works for Caroline, but it's not going to necessarily work for you guys. I mean, you're not going to sell your products on Instagram in the way that Caroline can. So I presume you haven't tried and I presume yeah, you don't want to, but it, <laughs> you find the right platform for your business. That's yeah. it in a yeah. nutshell. I mean, in a way it's almost stating the obvious, but it's, John knows, people need a bit of help just to, to, to see what actually works sometimes. John knows his, his public contracts people. Just go and get more of them down south across the water, all the other accounts, whatever, just more of the same. Mm -hmm. Caroline knows it's, it's a certain type of person now. It's maybe not just the teenagers, they make the money. It's, it's a different type of person that values what she provides. And Sean's just, you know, hit the, hit the nail on the head, like with a 16 years preparation for working remote and, and cyber security. So, yeah. yeah. Get a landing. The answer is get a landing and uh, put it on Zoom and you're guaranteed success. That's your experience anyway, isn't it? Um, yeah, I suppose I've done a bit of research on Caroline and, and John and you know, looked at the personality type. So you're, you're a counsellor, you're an architect, and I'm a motivator. You're a motivator as well. Am I? Yeah. Um, so I think it's about you know, putting yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, I, when I worked for Foyle, I was very happy there. Did what I did for a long time, but you know, I was aware there were changes. I wanted a new challenge. Big light bulb moment for me is understand myself. Um, very obvious thing to say, but you know, understand why I feel the way I feel every day, and you know, getting up out of my bed, wanting to be motivated to motivate other people to help them, um, and that works in my business. Um, what John does works in his, and what Caroline does for her business works. But they're all different, and mm -hmm. you know, bad experiences when we look for silver bullets. So we've done you know a couple of big projects on marketing, automation, and looking at sort of. Uh, surveillance capitalism type approaches, you know, where we're trying to read people's minds. Um, those silver bullets don't, don't really exist. It's about getting out there and getting your shoulders to the wheel and working hard and understand that every business is different. And you've got to put the effort in to, to draw the benefit at the end of the day. I mean, it's not easy, presumably. No, well, the big thing is that the energy comes from me. Mm -hmm. So I have to take care of myself so I can take care of others. And... Um do you, so when you come to look for somebody to work with you in the business, are you looking for somebody who complements you or somebody who can be another version of you? What, what works and what doesn't work? What would you employ? Another version of me? Because I, I wouldn't. No. No. <laughs> um, I, I'm looking for people who are smarter than me, want to work harder than me, um, people that we can have an exciting journey with. Um, yeah, I want you know, a good, varied workforce, um, people who are culturally aligned to the business. Um, who see things similar in a similar fashion to myself and different, people who can challenge me, um, people who just want to make change. And who, but what, and who buy into a vision? Are you, are you, a vision? That, I'm not really into vision. Not, you know, right, so okay. people talk about the, the vision board. Yeah, I have a vision board, but money's not on the vision board. Right. Money happens because of some of the things I do uh, in, in a positive fashion by working hard at myself, trying to push the people who work for me to push my own family. Um, and that usually exists. So I've been reading a book by a guy, Aidan McCullins, called Undisruptible. I would suggest it for anybody who's run the business. And he talks about a lot of things, but one of the things he talks about is whenever the British Empire started to produce maps of the world, that anywhere they hadn't explored, they would put the terminology in, here be dragons. So because they didn't know what was there, they had to be afraid. And that's a human instinct. So we've, we've found, LockTech has found, I have found, that you know, when you push yourself outside those boundaries, when you do get uncomfortable, get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's where the most fun is to be had. It's still scary, but that's where you can start to move forward. Mm. Do you, as far as Greentown's concerned, do you have some kind of corporate identity that you hope people will buy into? Or if you've got 180 employees, that's a lot of different people working in different areas with different mm -hmm. skill sets, um, but is there an overarching green view, sorry, green town way of doing things? Yeah, um, react when it goes wrong. <laughs> uh, 
th we struggled with the, the communication within the business. Um, was pro was fine for about 30 or 40 employees, and then somewhere along the line, we we, we stopped communicating with our staff in house. So two two three years two years ago, we brought in corporate meetings, and not it sounds formal, but it's just a sit down with the main drivers in the business every month. And on the back of that, then we we had. Uh, breakout meetings and there weren't meetings about meetings, the meeting ran every month but they were structured and that made a big difference. I uh, wouldn't have needed it again up to now but definitely two, three years ago it was about two. With a private business you don't put the, you don't put the structure in until you, it's always a year or two late. So there was one financial year we had 90% growth which was mayhem and the best way to describe it is putting pl plasters and broken legs. And Afterwards, then we, we we were able to put this. You can never have the structure in before in private. We're not we're not funded. We, we we're there to make a profit, and you you don't have the confidence that you need the structure until you have the until you have the growth. So when you have the growth, you have to go back and then put the structure in. So you're 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 getting the structure that you needed two years ago, and you're full time improving what you do and and. Um, Around that is the communication within the business, and there's and I, I have a list. I don't I'm, don't have a vision board, but um, every Christmas, get a few days, and I put a list of what uh, what needs tackled in the business, and and it's just wrote up on the board one to twelve, and walk through that, and that's what works for us and the team. I, it used to be a lonely job in the first three or four years. That was it was me myself, but there's about eight or nine people that shared with, and we break it out between us. 90% growth in, in a year doesn't necessarily mean it's straightforward for the business. No. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean no, you you're running a, a good, efficient business with 90% growth, presumably. No, you can, you can never have 90% growth and um, give a brilliant service to your customers, definitely not. We got through it and we took on the work and found a way to get through it and head on to the customers. And the following years, we put things right and they were patient with us. Right. But we didn't say no, we couldn't do it. We found a way afterwards. That's 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 very interesting. Um, yeah, sorry, Mark, I had actually a question for the guys. Um, Sean, you gave us some sort of key lessons that you had there, and I was just interested to hear from John Ross and Caroline if you were to give us kind of one, your biggest lesson that you've learned in the business sort of thus far, whether about sales or, or more generally, um, what do you think that would be? Every day is a school day. <laughs> Continuous self-development all the time. Um, for me, it would be probably just like realize that everybody's in the same boat. Like everybody, hate to use this term, but it's just winging it day by day. Like if you're laughing, you understand it. Like you know, we are. We're, we're all learning day by day, and nobody knows it all. And each day is going to be a new challenge, and you just have to learn as you go. And for me, probably the biggest challenge was like. I would have thought when I had a product that would have been going into like maybe pharmacies or hair salons, like when was the stage that I would contact a buyer, you know, like, you know, where do you get these buyers from? Whereas the buyers then contacted me, but I wasn't ready, you know, I'm like a hairdresser that stands behind people and, you know, asked them to go out at the weekend. I wasn't used to talking to people on such a professional level. So that was something that I really had to learn. And a lot of like the buyers would have, would have talked over the phones so that rang me, like, I don't even have a phone in my cell and like I'm not used to the phone calls so I really struggled to portray myself over a phone successfully like, you know I found that people maybe were thinking like god she hasn't got a clue I just didn't like not seeing the person so I was given really good advice you know tell contact the buyers and request a zoom meeting obviously zooms have become massive over lockdown and the difference of sitting down on a Zoom meeting, like face to face, like I worked a lot better seeing their body language, like over the phone, I'd be like, oh my God, he's so grumpy. Like I, it was like, I couldn't read them. Whereas when you seen their facial expressions, you realize that they weren't actually, they were quite relaxed. They were, you know, enjoying the conversation. Like I just, yeah, I work far better one-to-one. -one, so that was a big learning curve for me that to have the confidence to just ask for what you feel you need um, from something. John Ross, anything you want to add about big lessons? I'm trying to say something smart, but <laughs> no, um, be, be yourself. Um, 
you, as business owners, we feel we have to act in certain ways. But I started the business um, doing what I, I enjoyed doing as, an, as a general operative before that and, and worked my way up. So if you can keep um, enjoy, keep go back to the course, and I was sitting in Gareth's talk, Gareth Dunlop's, and I was sitting there thinking, jeepers, I haven't spoke to customer. Uh, you know, I used to, in the first two or three years, every customer I knew personally, I knew inside out, and about the, it was about customer experience. I was sitting there taking notes, and I goes, I need to speak to them, see what they think of Greentown. How you know? Because as you grow, it's not you giving the service; it's, it's your team, and they don't. You're only as good as your worst employee. And I think if you remember that, that uh, if you're only as good as your worst employee, that's not. You'll never be complacent because you know some of the ones representing you. Yeah, <laughs> most of them are brilliant. Hold them time today. Yeah. <laughs> any, anybody else Looking have any? Th there's a lady just there. Yeah. Hi, this is for you, John Ross. Um, just we work with a lot of small companies, and over the last few months, um, the thing we're hearing over and over is that they can't get workforce. They can't get people. You have 180 of them. How have you managed to get them and keep them? Yeah, we sure, tell we tell a lot of lies to them. <laughs> and I haven't caught on. Um, yeah, we were very lucky, and that, that was an advantage of being so rural in, Flor in Florence, Gordon, not that people in Florence would just wander the street. Um, but we, we attracted, you know, I, we were never going to get the workforce we were getting unless we'd done things differently. And by opening small divisions, like we have a depot in Macrofelt that employs um, 12 operational staff, we have a depot in Lisbon, and then we have a depot in Dundalk in Dublin. The advantage of that is, you're cut, yes, you have more costs and rent and depots and everything, the infrastructure, but you're cutting your diesel costs, you're cutting your running costs, but you're also get your employing from a bigger pool, and you're only going to get so much by, by having one depot, and that's something that not one of our competitors do, you know, do it that way. We have a competitor in Cookstown, and he services all the north from, from his depot in Cookstown. So we're, we open ourselves up to more staff, we open ourselves up to more different markets, cross-border markets, by doing that, and that's what worked for us, because in a, in a 30 mile radius, you're only going to get so, so many staff. So we've had to just open different depots and be local to everyone. Um, it, d d does everybody find it reassuring in the room whenever you hear three people up here who are you know, being held up as experts saying, we're just kind of working it out as we go along. We're not quite sure. We're giving the impression we know what we're doing, but we don't really. Is that is that comforting? Yes. There's a lot of nodding going on. Okay, that's good. Does that make you feel good? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that, yeah. Mark. No, 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 no. But it just it just means there's um, there's no perfect answer, doesn't it? I suppose that and every day is a learning day. I still think you need you need a plan. Yeah. That you know you sit down and you have a vision of where you want to go, put the numbers down, think about where you want to sell, who you want to sell to, yeah. who, who you don't want to sell to, um, and you, 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 know, you need to review and look at that on a real good spreadsheet. Yeah. You, have, have you, a you, you two are going to have an interesting conversation afterwards about spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. um, and just, we've, we've just a couple, five minutes, maybe just, uh, if there's anybody else wants to, I'm happy to take, I just wanted to take a bit where, where, where you go next, we'll end on that point, but there's it's just a simple question. Over the last two years, what's been the most difficult or dark time for you in your business, and how did you overcome it? Yeah, good question. Because we've all um, we've all gone through the, the the two and a bit years of of COVID. What was the? Well, you said you you didn't like the fact that you couldn't interact with people in a way that um, that you enjoyed I was doing. Say, is it wrong? The first word that comes to my head is wine. <laughs> <laughs> That was the solution, not the problem, was it? <laughs> no, um, well, obviously two different businesses, but with Hidden Hair, the biggest thing for me was scaling the business back and not being ashamed to scale the business back, like closing a salon in one area and downsizing like to the outside world like would look like I wasn't successful, whereas in the business was, was fully booked and was really successful, but I just wasn't happy in it. Um, the business ran me instead of me running the business. So, you know, me compared to these other two lovely men beside me, but, you know, I just wasn't capable of running such a big team that I took me away from the services that I loved. So I suppose it was just having the confidence to be like, no, I need to do this for me and I don't need to worry about 
what Mary says down the lane, you know, it's just, I suppose, not worrying about everybody else because it's, it's your life at the end of the day and you have to be happy. Um, so that's the selling end of it. And then when it comes to Bialmy, the biggest learning curve for me was being ready for Christmas. I don't think anybody would tell you how early you have to prepare for Christmas. Like from my first year to my second year, I probably prepared maybe three months early and it still wasn't early enough. So like now Christmas is sorted long ago. So you can't So really Christmas coming, you're sorted for? Yes, yeah, so you have to have everything like ordered. So basically you can never be organized enough. Um, and get a good spreadsheet so I'm getting better I have learned <laughs> so I uh, so yeah it's just yeah. I suppose um, learning from your mistakes John Ross um, probably w when you start your own business and you're employing for, you, you take it very personal when you've staff that grow the business there's no one that works for Greentown that was with us with me in the first three years and that sometimes can be why well, he must have been hard to work for but um, I, I, don't, I can't put my finger on it, but I, I would have, you know, there would have been an instance where we had uh, supervisors and they seen the growth that Greentown had, and they would have came and pitched to me, but you're, I seen in the website, you're getting this for this job, and I'm running this job, and I remember taking a guy down, and, and he goes, many drums a weed killer are we using a week? And he says, about 8 to 10, I says, much, much is the weed killer? He says, about £30, I says, no, each one of them is £80. So he, he'd seen this figure that we got. But were that related to me, you know, and, and once I explained it and sat it down, he realised, but he, he left me and he came back and it was, it was more, to, it was, this says more about him than me, it was very good, he came back and said, you know, you remember two years ago I'd done that, and uh, he says, I was completely wrong, I was out of order, and he, he, we get on well since, but some of the staff... When you're starting a business, you get very personal with your staff, and I still do, but there's a structure there now, and I would have, at certain instances, you would have took it really personal when someone left you, or if someone didn't mm. complete the journey with you, but the team that takes you so far isn't always the team that takes you to the next level, and what you need at the start isn't what you need to take, it, take you further. So I probably would have struggled with, with that, and want, I expected everyone to, to have the okay. same outset as what I had and wanted to be on the journey, but that wasn't the case. Mm. Sean, what, what about that dark, dark days, big uh, challenges so over the last number of years? Two, the two things is an incident and a challenge. So the incident, Caroline could have helped me with. Um, I have five kids from 20 to 24, sorry, down to 14. The youngest lads, long blonde, straight hair, um, seven, eight weeks longer into COVID, it need needed to be uh, cut. So I attempted to do that about, <laughs> about 7 o'clock about 7 o'clock on a Wednesday night. I live about 10 miles out the road. So by 9 o'clock I was walking up the beach on my own in Port Stewart <laughs> um, and had left a fairly volatile <laughs> red-headed wife. Um, so that, that was an incident, probably a low point. Uh, <laughs> I went back to the office the next day. I thought about. I just thought, you know, I'll go back tomorrow. I've got an office in the town. Wife's not there. Kids not there. And hairdressing's not the way I'm going. Um, and then maybe a bigger challenge than my hairdressing skill sets is now is, uh, is people's mental health after this. Um, you know, I suppose I've had one incident in my life where I got look at what it, what, it, what it looks like when you've got that problem. Uh, I've got very good at now at. Uh, Recognising that, and you know, being able to deal with personally uh, with my kids, um, but with my employees, uh, I think it's a really big challenge. You know, um, that I'm not really entirely sure how to, how I'm going to deal with that, and you know, I can see with customers and with some of my own staff that you know, the definite there's, there's been a big change there, um, and it's it's not something that we can ignore is, is the welfare of the people who work for us anymore. Um, and I think COVID has underlined that. Yeah. That's something that maybe we've all learned over the last couple of years, that we need to take that aspect of things a lot more seriously. Yeah. And that's true. Um, listen, just to land it, quick word, I mean, uh, just a couple of bullet points each, just on on maybe where you're thinking of going next, how, how you move up a level, if you're going to move up a level, how you keep going, where you're going, just to land the conversation, what, how do you see the next six months well, my dad, year, 18 months going. My dad always talks about this black van that he wants with the Bialmi logo on it. So that 
strikes retirement, so that's the pressure that's on my shoulders. Um, but you know, my year ahead, I, I've actually just recently just signed off on a few new products. So um, I have a couple of really big launches this year, so I'm really scaling up um, on Vialme. So huge risks and scary, but I'm in this deep now. I'm going to keep going. I'd rather fail trying than wonder um, what if. Well, we should all be looking out for you on Instagram. Please go on, yes. Everybody does come Christmas. So there you go. Um, John Ross, yep. how do things look for you? We've a couple of new services going on and um, starting and then it has started, but it'll probably take two years to get going, right? Um, and hoping that it's just a small, gradual growth as opposed to madness. You're not going to take the neighbour's end again, huh? No, no, never. <laughs> Sean? Um, just keep going. Um, I suppose 18 months ago we were approached by another company to to uh, merge. Um, I suppose effectively what was going to happen was that I was going to be given a reasonably well paid job to do what I do now, but I was going to have to do what I was told, so I'm, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I refuse. Did you think about it? Did I think about it? Mm. For about 10 minutes. Yeah, for about 10 months. Because there was, there was some money involved, it was, you know, you talk about doing away with whatever bits and pieces of debt, you know. I have... Uh, one daughter who's uh, started a job in a lab in Belfast, graduated, the second one is a nurse, uh, which was interesting during lockdown, uh, and she's going to start working now, she's living up out in the Gavin, um, third one's student teacher, so those are the returns I have on, on my investment, that's what means uh, a lot to me, um, and I've got two lads, I've one lad doing an exam at GCSE today, um, which is... It was a lot easier with the girls than it was with the boys. <laughs> I agree with you there. <laughs> um, listen, I think we've, uh, we're, we're, we're slightly over time, so I want to leave it so that um, everybody can enjoy having a chat over, over lunch and the lunch isn't uh, burned. But can I just on behalf of all of you say a very special thank you to Caroline and John Ross and Sean for um, taking part and, uh, and being so candid <laughs> in, in, uh, in dealing with the questions. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Just a wee present. Here's a, <laughs> a, <laughs> a presentation. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so, so thank much. You. Thank you very um, much. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, folks. You, you deserve that. Um, word of thanks to the Council for supporting the Sales Academy programme and uh, today's event. And thanks also to um, Niraj and the other people who took part in uh, our conversations and led our, our master classes. Um, just a quick note, if you haven't registered for the Sales Academy, you can do so now to avail of free mentoring, support and workshops. There's a URL code in the conference pack, which you should all have, that you can use to register. So look out for that. Um, also, a uh, request that you fill in the feedback sheets that are in the conference pack and drop them into your feedback box, which will be at the door on the way out. Um, there is, as we said well at the done, beginning, uh, or there will be well a done. YouTube Beautiful. recording of the conference, and it will be available on the Council's Thank YouTube you channel, so you can watch back any of the master classes that you didn't get to attend. And the address for that is www.youtube.com slash c slash slash Fermanagh Oma District Council. So it should be easy enough to find it. Presumably that will be up in the not too distant future. And finally, um, just a special word of thanks to Kieran McCrory, who was a fellow Queen's student with me uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, we were fellow politics students, and it was good to catch up with him again. And thanks to his economic development team, Dona, um, Siobhan, and Jenna. Thanks to Ruth and the Full Circle team for organizing the event, and everybody here at the Silver Birch Hotel. Um, that is it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. hope you found it useful. And thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm away back up to Belfast to talk about the protocol. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>